Good evening and thanks so much for tuning in. This is The Money Show on ET Now and my name is Alex Matthew. We're going to be speaking about a couple of very important topics today. The first one relates to young couples that have decided to tie the knot or that have just tied the knot. They're taking the first steps in their journey together and we're going to be talking about the importance of financial planning and how they should ideally be on the same page. The tips and tricks that you need to know is what we're going to talk about. The second conversation I think is equally important because it's the next logical step that a lot of couples take which is to expand their family and to bring a child into this world. What are the factors that you need to bear in mind? How early do you start saving? And once the child is on the way or if the child is already here, what do you need to do? What is the checklist that you need to follow? Let's get started with the first conversation then. It's wedding season and chances are that either you or someone that you know is tying the knot or maybe you've gotten married within the last couple of years. I think this is a very good time to start talking about the first topic that we have which is what are the various things that you need to bear in mind from a financial planning standpoint in order to start your journey on the right note. My guest today is Mrin Agarwal, founder of Finsafe. Thank you so much Mrin. For joining in yours was the first name i thought of when i thought that we would have this conversation so just to begin with i think we need to establish Marin, that it's not a one-size-fits-all solution people find what is best for them but having said that what are the first few things that you need to bear in mind so that you start your journey on the right note good evening alex nice to be here on the show today um and talking about this very interesting topic I think the first thing is really to have the money talk. A lot of couples don't have it before the marriage or after the marriage. And you know, it just things just, they just go by whatever is happening, right? But it's very important to have that money talk to figure out how the family finances are going to be managed. Is it going to be done by the husband or the wife, or is it going to be done jointly? And the other point is that when you are starting a, a new relationship um, and, you know, as they say in all the vows, right, that you're going to be truthful to each other, the same thing holds with your finances as well. So you need to be honest about your finances. So if you are uh, uh, starting the marriage with having a lot of loans, you need to be honest about it. And I think both the partners really need to discuss as to um, how um, uh, this portion is going to get managed. So I think the first step uh, to my mind is to have the money talk and to be um, truthful about one's financial situation. Okay, absolutely. Because you talk about when you meet somebody, you talk about their physical wellness you talk about their mental wellness. I guess it's also very important to speak about their financial wellness. Now, there are a few problems, Mrin, that people face along the way. Uh, and I think we should talk about some of them because I think we'll address quite a few of the issues that uh, people face uh, in, this, uh, in the first few topics. The first issue, I think, is having to uh, think about someone besides yourself. And uh, you've been so used to budgeting for just one person that you can't think of one more person. So how do you think you can fix that element? Well, you'll have to create a budget together. Uh, there is no two ways about it. And I think the biggest contention point always between couples is uh, splurge expenses. So you need to have a splurge fund. You know, we, we talk about emergency fund and we talk about every other fund. But I think uh, one of the very important things to keep marriage in, intact and you know most divorces happen because of money issues so i think the first thing is both of you need to uh, uh create a family budget normally i recommend a 30 30 40 which is 30 percent expenses 30 percent emis and 40 percent savings and from the 30 percent that i've mentioned about expenses you need to have your essential expenses as well as your fun expenses. So each partner should have an X amount for fun expenses where they spend on whatever they want to with no questions asked, with no judgments passed at all. And um, I think that would be a good way to come to a good uh, understanding and agreement on the budgeting piece. You know, that very neatly Mrin, brings us to the next point, which I think a lot of people 
uh, face as an issue, which is how to manage cash flows. And I've heard or I've spoken to a few couples where one individual saves their entire salary. So their entire salary goes towards the investments for both the couples. I don't know how effective that is. Another possibility, and I think I've I've uh, benefited immensely from this. This is something that I came across in a book by Monica Halan where she talks about having both your savings accounts if you are both earning and you have one joint investments account, one joint expenses account. At the start of every month, 30% of each person's salary goes and sits in your investments account. Which of these two is the better one and is there a third maybe to consider? Well, um, what I would say is that whatever other uh, family expenses need to be uh, proportioned as per the earning, because both partners are not going to be earning the same salary. So they need to be proportioned as per the earnings. And certainly that needs to be either you create a joint account for expenses or, you know, the whole idea is that let's say one partner is earning 60% of the total income and the other is earning 40%. So they spend accordingly. But I think the easier way to do it would be to have an account where you deposit the money and make the payments from there. Uh, investments can be done individually from their own accounts because these are their primary accounts where uh, they are going to be um, the uh, taxable person as well. So I think the investments can be done from their individual accounts. But of course, it goes without saying that the individual should be done uh, jointly as either a survivor. Absolutely. And one of the factors I think that uh, helps me out in that uh, mode that I've just described Marin, is the splurge expenses because whatever gets left over after investments and uh, uh, expenses gets left in our own savings bank account. So then we can splurge on whatever we want. But there's also another aspect, right? What if only one partner is working? Is it important for the non-earning member to also have a, an account for themselves and have a stipend so that they can spend on, on their own needs? Oh, absolutely, they should um, because they do have their own needs and they're not working for a particular reason. So the other partner is getting some benefit out of it. And, you know, uh, in the previous question, you also talked about um, of how there are some couples where one person's salary is spent on expenses and one person's salary is spent on only on investing. And I think that's a really bad idea because the person whose salary is spent on expenses has nothing to show for themselves even after 10 years of savings, right? So that's not a good idea at all. So I think even if you if one person is not working, they should get a stipend, they should have their splurge expenses as well that's allocated to them because they also have their needs. Okay. Um, you know, I, I was uh, then going to come to investments because this is something that in my conversations with a lot of uh, young people, a lot of couples, uh, the answer that I get usually when I ask who handles the investments is, oh, he takes care of it or she takes care of it entirely. I don't understand anything, so I'm happy with that. But how important is it even to the extent of understanding, okay, these are the baskets, these are the passwords, these are the login IDs that you need to bear in mind, having it maybe written down in a diary so that the, your partner knows exactly where the funds are and why something is being put in a particular investment. So there are two things. Uh, one is when the going is good, it's all fine. But things can go bad. There can be many situations. There could be a medical emergency. There could be a contingency. Um, it, it could be that the relationship is not working out. And that's when the partner who is not involved or even aware of financial matters um, then bears the brunt of it all and really finds it very difficult to live life. So life is always very uncertain. And that is why it is really, really important that both partners be fully aware, at least of the family finances. Uh, even if there's one partner who's managing the money, it is that person's duty to actually make the other person aware of where the money is being invested along with the login ID and passwords. Now, the second reason is also that even though you are a couple, you know, they say opposites attract. And I think the same thing works for uh, finances as well. So one of the partners could be wanting to take more risk or happy to take uh, more risk, but the other partner may not want to take risk uh, for the same financial goal or even their financial goals 
uh, might be different. So just on the lighter side, you know, one of the partners might want to do the NFTs that have just been launched in the last few days. And the other partner might be like, I don't want to do NFTs. I want to stick with good old equities, right? And also the goals, the goals, this, you know, for the same goal, like if both of you have the retirement goal, the goal might be different. One person might want to live on the mountains. One person might want to live on the seaside or one person might want to live in the hometown, right? So this is the reason why, uh, like how everything in life gets handled pretty much together, finances also need to be managed together. You know, it's interesting that you point out NFTs because I was going to ask you that very thing. <laughs> and, and you already spoke about this, but I want to perhaps ask you in conversations that you've had with young couples also, what if you come across a couple where one person says, you know, I want to invest in cryptocurrency. And because the other person is entirely risk averse, that person's not comfortable with it at all, but is not really active in the management of the investments. How should one solve a problem like this? Well, I always say that if you are uh, investing for all of your other financial goals, it's okay to have 5% cut aside as fun investing where you're ready to lose the capital. So as long as you stick to that 5% and the part, the other partner is aware of it, that you've put this 5% there and is okay with it, it's fine to do so. Okay, that's fair. Now, the last thing that I want to talk about with regard to this particular conversation is the matter of loans. And incidentally, Mrin, a lot of uh, people are talking about this comeback in real estate. And that really is perhaps one of the big life decisions that couples make in that they buy a house that they move in together uh, uh, or move into together. Uh, this factor, though, um, the EMI factor. And you said that 30% of your joint uh, income should go towards or could go towards EMIs. The fact is that in a lot of cases, this is not possible. You have to take a much larger EMI. What should the attitude towards loans be? Well, I mean, I would still say that you need to try and limit your EMIs to 30% of your joint uh, income. And I think it should be possible. Uh, but, you know, certainly it cannot exceed 50%, right? Because the moment it's exceeding 50%, you've bought a house that could be really way beyond your means. Um, and either you buy a smaller house or you maybe delay the whole house thing. But certainly if you're going to be spending more than 50% of your uh, joint income on EMIs, you're really not going to end up having much left to save. And it's really important to save for the future, right? So... Uh, clearly, uh, there are two things as far as loans is concerned. It's not only about home loans. Uh, you also need to think about all the unsecured loans that you have, uh, especially right now. Buy now, pay later has become so popular. But um, I was just seeing some data where, you know, even over there, the delinquencies are anywhere between 15 and 20 percent. So a lot of people take these loans but are not able to pay them back because they have a lot of other loans. So I think the first thing should be that go in for that large loan only once you've cleared off all of your unsecured loans. Uh, of course, uh, you know, there's no point in taking loans that you can't pay back and whether it's buy now or it's um, personal loans or credit card loans that people are using for vacations. I mean, there's no point in getting into this at all, you know. So first clean up um the unsecured loans then get into the big loan and again keep that big loan limited to 30 percent of joint income at the max 40 to 50 percent and not more than that mm, important because if god forbid something happens to one of the partners then it becomes incredibly difficult to keep that loan going now uh Nrin, do stay with us we're going to have a very interesting chat also about how uh, financial planning and your approach to financial planning needs to change if you decide to have a child and in fact if you already have a child on the way or if your child is already here. Do stay tuned, we've got more on the other side.